Uh, all right. Uh, hi, everybody. So um, welcome to VSA webinar. So today we have a shifted uh, version, uh, shifted webinar in time. Uh, but uh, after today, we resume our two um, uh, fortnightly events. So the next webinar will be on 15th of March. Uh, I'm happy to, um, to present uh, Alexei Kovalev. Uh, he's a PhD student at uh, HSE University in Moscow, Russia. And uh, he will be presenting uh, his research on uh, using vector symbolic architectures for um, tasks of visual question answering. So without any further delay, so I leave the floor to Alexei. So he will introduce further. Uh, thank you, Evgeny, for good introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. I just say it again, my name is Alexei Kovalev. And um, I'm pleased to be here and present to you our work, which is done with, with my co-authors, Mahmoud Shaban, Daniel Kirilenko, Evgeny Osipov, and Alexander Panov. And the title of this work is Combining Vector Symbolic Architecture and Semiotic Approach to Visual Question Answering. And um, at, at the beginning, I'd like to introduce you to the task of visual question answering. Give me a second. One moment. I have some some problems. Okay. Yeah, so that's right. Uh, so uh, in this task, uh, the system uh, AI system, uh, given an image and a question in natural language, uh, should give you an answer. Uh, and um, the questions may, may be different. Uh, the images may be very difficult to understand even for human. And um, there's several uh, common data sets in this area. One of them on the left of the slide is called uh, VQA, which stands for Visual Question Answering. And uh, this was, um, this is, uh, I would say, the most famous data set. And uh, it's very difficult uh, in terms of images and uh, in, terms, uh, in terms of common sense reasoning, because if you uh, look at this example, for example, here, uh, where we have a pizza, and the question, is this a vegetarian pizza? Uh, so um, the system should have a knowledge of uh, vegetarian. And maybe on this uh, picture, the system uh, should understand what means 2020 vision. Uh, but on the other hand, the uh, data sets which simpler in vision, uh, in visual part, but uh, still very interesting and uh, quite complicated in reasoning tasks. Uh, on on the left, uh, left uh, right side of the screen, uh, you can see uh, an example from Clever dataset. And this is a, uh, a synthetic dataset, what was generated in Blender engine. And um, nevertheless, it's synthetic, it's still quite uh, quite difficult to answer for us human because uh, if you consider this question, what size is the cylinder what is left of the brown metal thing that is left of the big sphere? So um, it requires um, like reasoning you know, about relations between objects and uh, we're not able to answer this in, in uh, like immediately. You have to think about this picture and like find uh, this big sphere, then uh, brown thing, a uh, brown metal thing, then just cylinder, and so on. And um, another interesting property of this data set, so it's called diagnostic because um, uh, they, the authors of the data set eliminated biases about questions and images because um, the usual problem with uh, VQA task that system can answer questions without looking at the image. Uh, if you have a question, uh, what is color of a plate on the table? So the system uh, just can say white, and this will be the right answer for like 90% uh, out of 10, uh, out of 100. Uh, so in these data sets, uh, the questions and pictures are balanced. Um, so the authors propose it as a um, task to uh, 
uh, uh, diagonal system, how well they work on VK. And if we take uh, one step further from this visual question answering idea, uh, we can finish in uh, at a habitat challenge. Uh, that is challenge and data set, it is the same name. That consists of a stand for, um, for a robot. So it's um, a, a real uh, environment. So this is what the pictures that are taken and, and uh, um, uh, constructed environment from this. And in this task, the agent placed at random point uh, in the scene, in the environment with random uh, orientation and is asked to find a special um, specific instance of some type of objects. It could be chair, sofa, or, or whatever. Uh, it should find this, uh, this object and navigate to it. And uh, the, uh, the type of questions asked in this challenge are quite simple. But if we extend uh, these um, ideas about the uh, navigation um, or, or of an engine in the environment and uh, um, extend it with more complex questions and more complex reasoning engine, then we can finish in something that's called embodied AI. So then our AI system, not just like a computer program, but it has uh, like it's a uh, representation in a real life, uh, in a real environment. And uh, this is something that is uh, called like uh, cognitive robotics and, um, or maybe, um, and even like cobalt. Yeah, that's uh, not for cognitive, but for collaborative robotics, uh, which uh, could assist uh, people in the like, um, usual task. But when we try to uh, solve this kind of, of problem, there is another problem that appears. And this is called a simple grounding problem. And the main, main point here is how uh, an agent represents its internal knowledge about concepts in uh, environment. So the agent has to uh, refer somehow from this internal representation to real objects on the one hand. And on the other hand, then uh, he or she refer to this um, a real object, it, uh, it, it has somehow to understand uh, what it uh, could do this, this, uh, this particular object. Uh, so how can, uh, it can be used. And uh, one of the approach to solve this uh, grounding problem uh, is apply semiotic approach. And um, uh, semiotic approach grounds in the work of uh, Soviet uh, psychologist Lev Vygotsky, Alexander Lure, and Alexei Leontiev. And uh, first two of them proposed the theory that called a cultural historical psychology. Uh, I just um, uh, read some of them, uh, the statement and um, like apply it to uh, robotic, robotic area. So first of all, they say that social environment is the main source of personality development. And uh, this means that uh, if, our object, uh, if our agent operate in, um, in coalition or in a group of agents, or maybe interact with other agents somehow. So this uh, could be um, like um, an, an opportunity to improve agent by itself. Uh, another that external activity and culture tools are subjects as uh, mining collapse interest in the internal plan of, of, of uh, he is of human, but uh, in our case, in agent. So this means that then agent uh, interacts with environment or with other agents. So at the end, uh, it could uh, replenish its own like understanding of the environment it works with or, or about agents. And uh, another uh, like, uh, idea that consciousness develops through the dialogue and again, this means that our agents has to interact with uh, these other agents. And uh, like in case of uh, like cognitive assistance and assistance robotics with uh, people as well. Uh, and another um, tool that we use, it's activity theory. It was developed by um, Alexei Leontiev. And uh, he said that uh, humans, uh, 
actions are subject. And uh, the main here is the goal. So uh, actually, uh, the any uh, activity uh, need uh, just to uh, like uh, to achieve some goal. So we can um, we can look at activities as as an object by itself, and uh, we apply it just uh, uh, we apply it when we want to achieve some some goals. And uh, when I talk about semiotic approach, um, there is like trade offs between uh, semiotic and uh, symbolic approach uh, to tasks. And uh, compared to the symbolic, uh, we need to have uh, several properties uh, to call the system semiotic. First of all, we have a special type that's called name uh, that helps us to distinguish one piece of information from another piece of information. In case of symbols, symbols like uh, named by the, by themselves. So the symbols and names are um, like glued together. But in semiotic approach, you have to have this distinct tag that's called name. Also, informa information should, uh, must be structured. Um, so there is no just um, separate piece of knowledge. They should have internal structure. And also, they, sh uh, they uh, have to be connected and combined into a network, uh, so they uh, they should re um, relate to others' uh, notions and uh, other information uh, with agent snow. Uh, another idea that uh, any piece of information, as it has internal structure, could be decomposed into its part, and then you can uh, have ability to look at the same piece of information from different level of abstractions. Uh, and that depends on the, our current task at the hand and what we want to do with this. Um, the main component of semiotic approach is a sign. So it's a special structure. So because, as I said, uh, any piece of information has, has to have structure. That's composed of uh, this tag that's called name, already mentioned it, and three other components, significance, meaning, and image. And uh, the idea behind this concept is um, as follows. So, Significance that is something uh, that shared among, uh, like knowledge that shared among the coalition of agents or group of agents. And um, if say some like example from real life, uh, if we, um, we'd like to call the uh, sign for, for a book. So the, th the uh, significance would be read book or buy a book. And meaning is something that um, agent develop through interacting with environment and this how experience works and uh, in some cases uh, you may read book or may or maybe you would like to candle fire this uh, this particular book and then this will be a um, meaning for you or like an, uh, our agent in this case um, image uh, could be considered as a, as a description of our object would help us to distinguish uh, one uh, sign from another sign. And in this case, like a book, a book has cover, uh, paper, uh, pages, and this is like distinguishable um, features of uh, this particular entity. And also, each sign, uh, like all signs, are interconnected into a network, and we call this network a semiotic network. And this is what we work with. So this uh, this is the main uh, like storage of knowledge uh, for, for uh, all agents. Uh, but uh, how, how uh, we are going to represent these components? Uh, in case of images, uh, we represent each component as a uh, collection of causal metrics, uh, causal matrices. And causal matrix is just simply a matrix, and in this simplest form, it will be a binary matrix. There, are each column corresponds to an event in time, and uh, each uh, row corresponds to feature. Then, if you have one particular place in this um, in this matrix, it means that this particular feature 
appeared at this time event. And each of this one, it's not just a number, it's a link to another side. So this is how they interconnected into a network. And uh, with this uh, particular structure, we can represent not just objects, but actions as well. And then uh, we have to split column indices into two parts. First parts uh, will correspond to causes. And another parts will correspond to effects. And there is just assumption that um, every effect appears after like every cause. Uh, but in, like, in simple situation, when we operate with these objects, we don't need this separation of indices and just work with a normal matrix. Uh, let's look at an example, how it, it works. Uh, assume we have to uh, recognize the face on a picture and uh, we do it by recognizing its parts. And in this case, we recognize first, uh, so uh, first left eye, then right eye, then nose, then mouth. And we have these time events in our causal matrix. matrix. And this corresponding rows for these features. And uh, we end with this diagonal matrix. But may happen that our system recognized this part in different order. So first right eye, then left, then mouth and then nose. And when we end up with this matrix and uh, this matrix is actually identical up to permutation of columns. And so, and they correspond to the same sign in this, uh, in this particular case, it's a phase. So we organize these matrices into tensors, we call causal tensors. And here by tensor, I mean just a multidimensional array, three dimensional in this case. And then we have already this uh, like two known uh, dimension for events and features. And also here we have this third dimension for precedence. But uh, there is a problem with it because if we increase the number of features, uh, so then the number of precedence increases and factorial. So the richer the description, the bigger number of prisons we could make. And uh, uh, this is uh, undesirable behavior for our system. And now when we know how this works like for one object, uh, let's have a look how we can organize it in, into hierarchy. Uh, so first we have this row input signal. So basically this picture. Then we have some feature extractor that helps us to uh, find this like smallest atomic pieces uh, of information. And they could be used any feature extractor and further we will see that in our case, we use uh, neural networks, convolutional networks to be correct. And uh, each of this part corresponds to its own sign, to its own uh, image component of the sign. It's called left eye, right eye, nose, mouth. And they, by themselves, a part of a sign is called head. And on the next level of abstraction, head is a part of body. And of course, body has another parts. So there are other uh, signs that connected to this sign. And then we end up with this, this uh, causal matrix on images, uh, uh, causal network on images. And now we are ready to uh, formally define uh, the sign and uh, but, but before it we have to uh, like I, I had to say about linking functions that functions that helps us to move from one component of a sign to another component so we can move from uh, name to image uh, from image to meaning and from uh, meaning to significance and we can move in other way and then we uh, assign the tuple of four components name and uh, corresponding uh, causal tensors for uh, images, meanings, and significances. And uh, such that, that if we apply uh, combinations of linking functions, starting from maybe this uh, tensor, we, we apply combination in, and we end up in the same tensor. So the sign is a, a stationary point 
uh, of this of composition of this uh, linking functions. And this helps us to um, to connect these four different causal networks on each of components that then uh, form the network, what is called semiotic network. And uh, this ap approach is already used in several applications. And here I just uh, briefly explain several of them. Um, here you, um, you, you can see the uh, problem of uh, navigating robot in the environment from a starting position to the goal uh, by using the so-called pseudo-physical logic. So uh, our agent uh, does not know anything about absolute uh, coordinates of its position or table is a cube, but it knows about relations such as uh, above, uh, below, left, right, farther, closer, and so on, and um, like far away, nearly, closely, and then agent is able to move from one, uh, like from starting position uh, to the goal. Another example is a, like a well-known block world where uh, you have to uh, plan how to construct a tower of, of uh, cubes. And the third one is smart relocation tasks where we have a coalition of agents and the goal of this agents uh, to move to this area. But um, they have uh, their obstacles on the way and uh, one of these objects is able to uh, uh, to move these objects uh, to, to move these obstacles, and another don't. So uh, th uh, they they should like work in uh, in coalition to help each other. Uh, they try to um, plan this path, but then they have to understand that uh, there is no st uh, straight path through these obstacles. Find the block. It is movable. Um, split roles between agents who will remove this uh, block, move it, and then plan again uh, to achieve this uh, this area to, to, to go to this area. Uh, so uh, in this task, uh, this symmetric approach is successfully used, and uh, in our case, we want to apply it uh, to visual question answering and. Uh, we not just want to apply it like by itself, but uh, we'd like to use the property what uh, we are saying uh, gives us, and uh, we can uh, use it in um, um, in our approach. Uh, as as I said, the stand is represented like here. Uh, like uh, we represent knowledge as uh, knowledge hierarchically, so they can um, give a description of a stand in hierarchical way. So they have ten objects in this ten, the attributes and the values. But as I said, the problem with this uh, matters is that you have this third dimension that grows with number of uh, features, and uh, also we have this like um, matrices which, uh, which corresponds to the same um, sign, but they different in their permutation. But what if we use, uh, we, uh, we represent each of these columns as a hyperdimensional vector? Then we can apply bundling to these uh, vectors to compress uh, this dimension and obtain just one uh, HD vector for this, uh, for this particular matrix. And then we can apply binding operation that helps us to build this hierarchical structure. So we will use binding to move from one uh, level of hierarchy to another, and we will use bundling to compress our matrix into one vector. And uh, in our particular case, we used uh, polar vectors uh, with dot product and similarity metric. Uh, so this is like the um, high-level idea what, what we want uh, to do. And also we were inspired by a very interesting work. 
which is called a narrow symbolic UK. And um, they use this interesting approach. Then uh, they disentangle the reasoning engine and stand and question representation. So if they used uh, like convolutional neural network to represent this stand as a table. So it's basically like a data frame. And also they used uh, like an LSTM encoder to represent a question as a program that couldn't be uh, applied to this uh, table. And actually each uh, line on this program is like a filtering function. That's like, uh, like, like, like uh, as you work with pandas and data frames, you can work with this uh, representation of stand and this program. And they get the answer to that. Uh, the interesting point here that they used um, very like um, uh, a very interesting approach to train uh, this part. So this is uh, quite obvious idea. But here they uh, pre-trained network in uh, in supervised manner for uh, three hundred question, uh, three hundred questions, and then they fine-tuned the encoder with reinforced algorithm. So what they uh, uh, done basically is that they input the question, translate it into a program, apply this program to the standard presentation, and then they uh, got an answer, they compare it to the ground rule. And if it's uh, like, uh, if true, yeah, then uh, uh, add one to the uh, reward to the system. Uh, and then they average this rewards uh, like, uh, in batch and use it uh, to, um, to to update weights of encoding. So the, this this was trained like in uh, reinforced manner. And we were inspired by this work, but in our case uh, we want to uh, exchange this part with uh, vector symbolic representation. And uh, we end up with this with our architecture. Uh, there we represent Sten uh, as a vector, as a HD vector. And uh, uh, apply uh, programs that uh, works with HD vectors to our Sten and extract the answer from this representation. Uh, also, we did uh, several like, modification of the original architecture, uh, and they used. I just go to the previous slide. Uh, here at the LSTM level, they used uh, one head at the end, and they predicted uh, filter-shaped send cylinder as a one token, uh, like uh, function and its attributes. But uh, we predicted uh, different, uh, like they separately function and the attributes that uh, helps us to uh, uh, to comprehend the dimensions. Because uh, if we increase number of functions, we have to increase number of uh, outputs of our head. But here, uh, we simplify this, this problem. Uh, and our set presented um, as follows. So each object, object represented uh, as a bundling of attribute values pairs, and there each attribute value uh, is an HD vector. So then each center represented as a bundling of objects binded is their representation. And I'll just explain a little bit like closer on this toy example. There we have this uh, simple scene uh, that has three objects circle, square, and uh, triangle. And you have just one attribute for each object, it's, uh, for each object, its shape. And here we have uh, HD vectors for shape, attribute for the uh, values. And also we have uh, HD vectors for um, positions of this, uh, of these objects on the scene. And uh, so uh, here we, a bind shape this its value circle, bind the special like ID uh, of this uh, particular object 
basically uh, HD vector as well. Uh, we do this for other two objects. And then uh, we add here the like, description of positions of this object on the scene, apply bundling. And, we, and at that, we got this whole scene representation as one HD vector. And now, when we have this representation, we are able to apply this like small programs, small steps in our programs that uh, answer the question, and there are several of them. And most basics, uh, uh, most basic procedures with um, given attribute and value pair returns objects with this attribute and value. And uh, here, first of all, uh, given like attribute and value as a name, as a symbols. Uh, we extract uh, the RD vectors from item memory, then combine, uh, then bind uh, them together and uh, get uh, attribute value vector, combine it with this center presentation, and find um, and, and get the uh, noisy version of, uh, of a vector just close to objects that have this particular attribute, with this particular value of this attribute. Then we query the item memory for these objects. And if the similarity between this noisy version and the uh, given object is bigger than some particular threshold, we add it to a list of results and return this result. And um, this is how we obtain objects with particular attribute and value. And also we can get um, a value for a particular object given an attribute. So here the procedure almost the same. So first we uh, extra, we get uh, HD vectors from item memory. Uh, then we construct this uh, pair by binding object vector and uh, attribute vector, bind it with a stand vector, get noisy version of a value vector, uh, find the closest vector in, our, uh, in item memory where we store these values and return as a result. And uh, applying these procedures in like in, in uh, as a programs, uh, we achieve uh, following results on a clever data set. So there are several types of questions in clever uh, for existing existence. So if there are any objects on the scene for counting, so we may, uh, we may be asked to count how many objects on the scene. Uh, we may uh, Ask to compare is the bigger uh, uh, which number is uh, uh, is greater like for the, uh, for these objects or for these objects. Then we can uh, query uh, the attributes and compare other attributes have the same uh, value. And on uh, two types of questions, our uh, our system in this in at this particular stage achieved almost perfect results. It's, almost uh, one, uh, it's, it's about uh, 0, 0.9997 uh, accuracy. Uh, but on the other questions, we, we have not so distinguished results, but uh, still they are better than the random choice. And uh, uh, we, we will be able to improve it. And in this particular plot, you see the um, dependence of accuracy for each type of questions. Uh, versus uh, HD vector size. So we use uh, quite uh, like, uh, big vectors. And uh, now uh, uh, we can like, uh, we, uh, this is the, our current work, yeah? But uh, also uh, uh, we, uh, we have in mind the work that like extend uh, this, this approach further and uh, this is actually what I talked about uh, at the beginning. So uh, if you consider the cognitive robot, uh, we uh, collect a data set that consists of images from habitat data set, but we ask people to ask a uh, question about these pictures here. And we, we collect it, it's now it's available through this link. So you can, uh, and download the 
the whole data and the equations. And uh, this will be a, a good like, like platform to start uh, with, uh, um, with developing of embodied AI. So then we have this uh, cognitive robot, which is able to navigate through environment, uh, interact with uh, humans uh, in natural language, and uh, like answer questions not just about the like, images uh, as in UK or, or synthetic sense as clever, but yeah, uh, even about or like uh, or real flats, yeah, like a real environment. Now we all live in. And as a conclusion, I would say that in our results, we have a working pipeline for BQA task. And uh, in this pipeline, we successfully combined uh, VSA architecture, semiotic approach, and uh, like neural networks. So this can be viewed as a, a neural symbolic. Uh, approach together, I would say. And um, our primary results, not so bad. Uh, there's, of course, uh, like space for further development, uh, but even now uh, they're quite good. And uh, there's great potential to extend this approach to other tasks such as navigation, uh, loop closure, and visual common sense reasoning. And uh, to check this, uh, like, uh, uh, to, to check these approaches on this uh, task, uh, we collect this uh, data set, this um, environment uh, images. And also the challenges. So first of all, uh, we'd like to achieve comparable accuracy to SOTO architectures on the one hand. Uh, on, the other, uh, on the other hand, uh, apply this approach to more complex data sets. Uh, so how we could apply this, not just to these syntactic uh, images, but for the QA that set by itself. And other question, what if there are more than 10 objects on this set? Or maybe that uh, hundreds of objects. Uh, is, uh, will we be able to um, use the same, uh, uh, we say plus a symmetric approach to solve uh, and to uh, have a description of this set? And even more, if there's not uh, just a few uh, features for each object in the set, but again, like uh, tens or maybe hundreds, uh, will we be able to, um, to deal with these kind of uh, situations? And that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'll just finish on this slide. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Alexei. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, so now I open the floor for questions, if any. So please unmute yourself and speak up. Yes. Maybe, maybe I can start with the with the first question uh, on my own. Um, so this scene representation. So we we all know that. Um, when you bundle together many objects, so the, the, there is an issue with capacity of um, uh, HD vectors. And uh, obviously, so um, not very great accuracy can be attributed to the uh, capacity. So how do you think to uh, overcome this uh, problem? Uh, well, really, this is the challenge I mentioned on this slide. So uh, if we increase the number of objects, uh, we, we, we will be able to use the same approach. And um, well, of, of course we can uh, increase the number, like the HD dimension of the vector, but uh, as you see like in, in this, uh, on, on this plot, uh, it helps, but uh, not, not too much in our particular case. And uh, so we can finish uh, at, at storing, uh, because now the store, just uh, like atomic vectors for um, attributes and uh, its values and the uh, final sen vector. But uh, if you will store uh, this intermediate results, maybe vectors for objects as their descriptions or maybe some parts of them, then uh, I think uh, we will be able to in increase capacity in terms of objects on the sen. Okay. Good. Any any more questions from the audience? Yeah, I had a 
question about the so how does the performance that you're seeing compare to other systems that are applied to this same data set the the clever data set mm, uh, thank you for your question uh, just okay uh, so for this uh, particular type of questions uh, we get comparable results so it's the same as the for example this work with uh, neural symbolic uh, vk uh, but for other types of questions, we still uh, have to increase our accuracy. Uh, so for this task uh, types, yeah, it's fine. It's it's like like sort of results, I would say. But for this, we still uh, still no work. Maybe you can spell out so what type of uh, what types of questions you have pro problems with. Uh, it's it's problem with uh, counting questions. Well, usually it's uh, like it's it's normal problem. Uh, with VK data sets, so uh, and with VK the systems, they usually better uh, at counting, and uh, also with oh, let's not check uh, these existing uh, existence questions. So uh, then the question is kind of uh, either um, an object on the sand of the same size as like a metal sphere on the left or the right. I, on, on the small rubber uh, cylinder, for example. So they could be such uh, complicated. And um, another problem question is uh, uh, like query accuracy. Uh, uh, then we uh, query some particular attribute. Uh, this is uh, now the uh, most problematic questions. Types. So basically whenever you need to extract one or several properties from a bundle, then you obviously have uh, questions, uh, problems related to the to the capacity. Uh, yeah. So yes. Because uh, as you see here, there's like compare num accuracy, compare attribute accuracy. Uh, we are good on these questions and. Um, the data set constructed in the way uh, they, they have two types of uh, like two types of questions. First one is like a linear, and another one is like uh, more, more tree like when they have like, two paths. And uh, then the question is like linear, they have like more, uh, more procedures on, on, on the stage. And it's uh, like difficult to get the right answer at the end because we have to um, filter. Or send for for several times. So how how should I read this chart in showing the accuracy compared to other systems? Do other systems get an accuracy of one, so that the like the exist accuracy here is like 0.66 compared to other systems getting one or or what? No, they got uh, close to one, so like uh, uh, zero. 96, 97, so 99 and 6, yeah. But uh, also they have this, um, uh, for, for example, in um, for this particular architecture, uh, they have like the deterministic approach and, and, and we still have some uh, like some randomness in the encoding. I mean, uh, it's, it's maybe uh, not like, yeah, I would say, um, uh, n n n n uh, not a lot of process what we uh, lose here, uh, but uh, it, it's it's still like uh, much much uh, the representation here is much simpler, and it's uh, they got this uh, like, like points in accuracy much simpler as well because here's just like normal uh, like data frame as as in pandas, and they just filter it. Okay, let's put here. All right, Ross. I see. I see you raising a hand. Uh, thanks for the uh, the talk, Alexei. Uh, about one third of the way through your presentation, uh, you were talking about the uh, the tensor representation of uh, signs uh, and how their components are related to each other. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, you're talking about there being a, a stationary point uh, relating those components. That's the one. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, and the uh, that's I think is before you start talking about uh, VSA. So you're, you're back in ordinary ordinary maths domain uh, at this point. Does that uh, stationary point um, relationship? Uh, play any role in the dynamics of your VSA uh, implementation, or is uh, that just a, a fact about the uh, about sort of the mathematical origins yeah. of, of these? Uh, 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 not in, in our case, uh, we use just uh, image uh, component of a side, so uh, we don't use the, the whole like uh, like structure. Uh, so and, the, and then it's uh, this uh, this particular property doesn't matter. I mean, this okay. is just high conceptual work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. All right. Uh, maybe we have time for one more question, if any. Well, uh, if not, then I uh, thank Alexei once again for the interesting talk. Uh, so, and um, thank you all for attending this webinar. So I uh, want to remind you that the next webinar will, uh, will take place in two weeks from now on 15th of March. Uh, so please have a look uh, at the schedule on the website, BSA Online. Uh, so the talk will be given by Dominic Vidos. So uh, with this, I want to end this webinar. So. Once again, thank you very much for attending and see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.